everyone. It's Hello. me again. I'm so excited to be with you on Thursday evening and my pal, Dr. Brian Dooley, Sherman Hello. College professor. And we are bringing you today um, philosophy, like an introduction to chiropractic philosophy. If you know all about philosophy and you want to chime in in the comment section, please feel free to do so. We'd also love to hear from you. So when you join us, let us know where you're joining us from. As well, Dr. Brian has committed to joining me a um, couple times a month to go through all 33 principles. If there's something in addition to the 33 principles that you'd like us to, to discuss um, concerning chiropractic philosophy, please either message Brian or you can message me and we are more than happy to do that and to have an open discussion. If you want to re remain anonymous, you can. If you would like to join us, we can have up to three of us, and however many three is, and, um, <laughs> and we we be happy to do that. So if you do have questions or comments today, drop them in the comment section, and please do let us know where you're joining us from. I'm in Alaska. Brian's in South Carolina, and we're curious to know where you are. Yes. So, Dr. Brian, welcome, yes. welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, people ask, well, what do you like to talk about? Well, this would be it. This is one of those things. That's right. That's right. I mean, I like to talk about 50, fishing and chiropractic philosophy. They're all about the, the same, right? Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, and Dr. Neva, thank you so much. And Dan McCoy, I'm the most philosophically sound, spizzed up non chiro out there, joining you from Pennsville, New Jersey. Awesome. Well, hello, thank Dr. You McCoy. Good. For joining us, Dan McCoy. And Dan is one of the coaches in the boot camp. Beautiful. He teaches the uh, boot campers about HIPAA, privacy, security, and how to have great technical automation in your practices. Oh, cool. Um, all right, so let's jump into an introduction sure. to chiropractic philosophy. Where do we start? Um, the one of the things that I like to start with is just understanding what it actually means to have a philosophy. Um, what, one of the things that, that yeah, that's sort of the probably the verb. And, and what does philosophy mean? Um, and to start with, with philosophy, there's five branches to it. And we try to talk to the students about it. We'll introduce it in class, but then we want them to see it in life, but we wanted them to, can you apply these branches to practice? And so number one I'll start with, with is epistemology. And so epistemology is how do we know what we know? And interestingly, one of the things that we hear so much is chiropractic is not scientific, which typically means that there's not any random clinical trials. And that's fairly true, although I would argue when Dee Dee adjusted Harvey Lillard, that was a random clinical trial because neither <laughs> one of them knew what was going to happen. And so, <laughs> so we had that's one awesome. in 1895. We don't need another one. I'm pretty good with that. <laughs> but, but the thought then is that these random clinical trials is, is the holy grail of, I guess, of science, of evidence. And the fact of the matter is it's only one criteria of truth. So how okay. we know what we know, certainly random clinical trials, we can know what we know by just this is what I saw, and I'm going to perceive that as true. Now, you could see something different and per perceive it as not true. So you take the World Cup the other day. England saw something that was awful. Croatia saw something that was great, right? <laughs> the same event happened on the field. So a lot of times our perception can get in there, and certainly with random clinical trials, Data can be manipulated. It's not that too hard to do in order to produce the result that our narrative is, whatever that is. Um, that tends to be an inductive style of thing. So let me look at something small and try to uh, apply it bigger. Um, chiropractically, and this is where some of the confusion comes in, is we're deductive. So we start big and then we come down small. And so if we're going to start deductively, um, we start with what's called our a priori, P-R-I-O-R-I -I statement, and that's your back-to-the-wall statement. It's typically, if it's big enough, it's going to be kind of hard to be defensible in your quote-unquote normal scientific ways. And so in chiropractic, we're starting with principle number one, and I'll get to that in just a second. But, you know, so the, the downside of a, you know, a priori statement, you know, the you know, upside is you can just logically follow uh -oh. it down. Oh, did we lose something? Oh, you stopped for just a second. I think you're back. Am I back? 
Yeah. Okay. So, so that's a really great speed bump. Can I go back and ask you for some clarification? Yes, ma'am. So, so how do we know what we know? You said random clinical trials are required, but it could also just be observation. Sure. And right? the issue, okay. well, one of the classic, I guess, uh, chiropractic defenses of the random clinical trials is there was the study in 1991 that came out and said, and this is not, I don't say this to bash medicine or allopathy, but that their procedures were confirmed, 15% of them were confirmed through random clinical trials. You know, the rest of it just seems like it's a good idea, kind of like the parachute, right? The parachute, there's no random clinical trial for it. Somebody, you know, who's going to be the control group of that one? <laughs> you know, yeah. quite honest. And so, you know, if, if you take, you know, this is how things go in South Carolina. I met my wife, so she takes me to go meet the family. I meet her grandfather, a super guy. I knew I was in the family when he showed me his gallbladder scar. So he <laughs> right pulls up on. his shirt, and he's got a scar, though, from here to here. And that's how they did it when he had a gallbladder surgery. You know, very invasive, because you're cutting everything from here to here in order to get it to gallbladder. When my dad had his gallbladder taken out, which oddly enough was the day after I graduated, so I don't know if that caused the problem, but he, <laughs> they did it laparoscopically, which was two nicks, still invasive, yes, but not near like the other surgery. There's no random clinical trial for that. It's just like, you know what, this just seems like a pretty good idea to do it this way versus that way. So yeah, we can look and do our, if our analysis is correct, and it says, if I can see that this bone is here, it just seems like a good idea that if it's here, the person functions better. So I'm okay with that. Some people aren't. Then people will say, well, that was a 1991 study. Well, then a study was done in 2017 that kind of relooked at that data. And the answer came back that they're up to a whopping 18% now. So there's still less than one in five procedures medically are verified through random clinical trials and quote unquote, the gold standard of science. So quite frankly, if they're not being held to the standard, then quit making us to be held to the standard. And so, so now let's stop there for a second, sure. who's holding us to that standard? Do you think it's as much the, the allopathic world as much as it is the allopathic chiropractor? Uh, well, I think that's a good point. I think um, for a while it was probably the allopathic world, because if you go back through the 60s and the Committee on Quackery and before then, I mean, why did chiropractors go to jail? It's not that we were hurting people, but it's because we were getting people well and they weren't using the other system. And if you go back, go way back, 1910, when the Flexner Report came out, um, that was funded by John D. Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie. And they wanted to know, where can I spend my money? And they to make me more money, and they chose healthcare, and so they chose the path. What's the path going to be to make us the most money? And so that was back in 1910. That's why you have a lot of your basic science classes, and then right away we're starting to be branded as these unscientific quacks as a PR campaign. Wow. Yeah, interesting. And always so, chase the dollar, Brian. Yeah, always a, chase a, the always. dollar. Always. <laughs> so you know. So there's the issue, and so then. Then it's like, well, we have to do, and it, it's not just in medicine. Most everybody probably would say you have to have these RCTs to prove that something is or isn't true, um, you know, but I don't need to do a random clinical trial to prove that my car is where I parked it this afternoon. I'm going to walk yeah. out of my building and observationally, I'm either going to see it or not see it, Yeah. Uh, but I don't have to have a random clinical trial to prove that it exists. So observational evidence is okay. And Hang on a minute, because actually I got something, a lot of slides down on observational evidence, because we use it all the time. And uh, we'll pull it up here. Okay, I got this is a big PowerPoint. So if you look at what some scientists say, right, real scientists, and these are people you may have heard of. Uh, so we will start with, so let's see, you got... Uh, well, we'll get to that because that's major premise stuff because they do talk about, but observationally, it's okay. Now, that being said, the danger of a deductive argument is what if the a priori statement is incorrect? If that's incorrect, then we kind of have to assume and, uh, that, that everything after it's going to be incorrect. And so that brings us to the major premise, principle one, which is chiropractic's um, a priori statement. 
And so it's not something that you're probably going to verify through random clinical trials and, and the census, but it's something is, are there things that we can observe that at the end of the day, this makes perfect sense to me? And that would be with principle one. Now, let me get back and back and back here. So I wrote down, if the uh, primary statement is incorrect, then we're not ever going to get to the right. truth, right? If, we might as well start it, with the it, truth because we're always going to end with it. But if we're not even starting with the truth, correct. then it, it's not like you're going to back your way into it, right? So No, exactly and right. That's, that's kind of where you make a statement and then you try to find evidence to support the statement. And if you don't find the evidence, then you change the statement to support, right? And then, right. And, and then make that statement agree with the evidence versus the other way around. Oh, yeah. And, and right? it just gets to be a big mess. And then the other side of it, too, is then let's just say the major premise is true. But now what's true? My interpretation of it or yours or anybody else's. And so this is where this is where I would love that us as chiropractors, if we knew these principles, when we're at these seminars, right, and hanging out afterwards, which to me is sometimes the best part of the seminars, is the, the community that, that they build, is let's talk about these things and, you know, let's do the whole Socrates on the steps thing where we're talking about these things and trading some ideas. I think what makes the principles a little bit difficult at times is as brilliant as BJ was, he's a 10th grade dropout. And so he's brilliant, but he wasn't scholarly trained. And so when he writes some of these things down, and granted, he's using 1927 language, he's also, um, he's trying to build and save a profession. So he really doesn't have a whole lot of time to just sit there and really think things out. Um, so we have to be able to go through there and say, what was BJ saying back then? Because if we're all starting from the same place, then we can advance it. Um, I, I think it's dangerous to say, because BJ said it, we can't critique it, uh, not manipulate it, that's a bad word, but we can't massage it a little bit or work with it, adjust it, if you will, to say, all right, this actually maybe sounds better. If we can say it this way, it's better for what he was intending in the first place. Um, so I think it, it, the, the principles themselves ought to be able to be discussed and debated. Um, so, you know, they're not gospel. I would argue that they haven't been disproven yet, um, but I think we ought to debate them. Are we saying this the best way possible? even not so much for the patient, because are we saying it so much for the chiropractor? Because, you know, I don't have conversations about universal intelligence with my patients often. Maybe it'll show up once in a blue moon, uh, but I need to know what it is. So when I start getting into these innate principles, I can um, say with certainty and clarity, this is what's going on in your body and why it's important for you to be laying on my table. Nice. I love that. I love that we're going through in this about the, like, let's just start at the very top with what is philosophy. We talk about chiropractic philosophy, but let's, right. let's identify that. So right on. If any of you have questions that are watching, um, please feel free to pop it in. I do want to say hi to a few people. Hey, Dr. Joe, thanks so much for joining me on these Facebook lives all the time. It's, an, it's nice to see you and Kat and Dr. Everman and Neva and Dan. And I can't see all of your other names. I apologize. It only lets me see a few. So um, thank you. Thank you. We appreciate you being here. All right. So epistemolo epistemology. Yep. So that was is... epistemology. How do okay. we know what we know? Okay. And so um, then we've got, uh, well, we can go to F uh, politics. So politics is not just government, but it philosophically means like the study of force. What actions are permissible? So how we would think about that chiropractically is, A, we would think about our state boards uh, and those types of things, you know, the CCE or whoever, but it also comes down to what's permissible in your audience. It's how we work with or your, your clients. It's how we work together. So, you know, do I want my, you know, a politic would be, do I want my CA calling me doctor or not? Do I want my patients oh. calling me doctor first name, doctor last name? Uh, don't care. And that's just something we have to decide. If you want to go by Dr. Eaton, I want to go by Brian, who cares? Um, yeah. But that's a political thing that we're going to decide because that's how we're going to interact as people and okay. what things would be permissible. Um, we certainly have ethics. Ethics typically, um, whether we think it's ethical or not, are going to be defined by our state boards. Because the other crazy thing that happened in 1910 was the Kansas Act which was actually the first statute in chiropractic 
Um, BJ was allowed to write this statute, which was good. The downside of that statute was it left it up to each individual state to decide what chiropractic is. And I don't know how many states there were in 1910, so say 40, um, but you can theoretically have 40 different uh. definitions of what chiropractic is, and the students wonder why we can't all get along. And, you know, this is 15 years into the profession um, when we're just defining things differently. Depends on who's on your board at that point. Of, and so ethically, so, you know, whatever state you decide to practice, you know, they, they can say you have to do this, that or the other. And ethically, you have to go abide by that um, in your state. Now, certainly you cannot do it, but then you do run the risk of whatever a board complaint or whatever you might have to go for. And even if you are, quote unquote, philosophically in the right, um, that's something we just have to think of. So when you're thinking, where am I going to practice? Open up those rules and see what's allowed in that state. Does it jive with you? Practice there. If it doesn't jive with you as much as you love it, take a vacation there, practice something else. Nice. That's great advice. Has there, has there been a time in our history that there was a, a, a group that tried to come together to overturn that Kansas Act? That's a good question. You know? Not that I know of. That would be a great question for Simon Senzon or the Association for the History of Chiropractic. Um, that, there you got a great Facebook page, but I, I doubt it. You know, at huh. that point, it's kind of like the horse has left the barn. So this is what we got to deal with. Um, yeah. So I, I don't even know how you would do it. You know, yeah. how, you know, do I in South Carolina have a right to tell Alaska what to do? Wouldn't work. Not really. So, but, but yeah, it, back then would have been nice if that was something that they fought for. Uh, they, it just didn't happen. Now, I'm going to assume maybe they even if they did try it. Um, they just said, all right, we're going to let, you know, cause there's back and forth going, well, then we're just going to let other States do it. And BJ wasn't asked to write all of them. If he was, yeah. maybe it'd have been better. Yeah. And I guess based on, on the population, I mean, it'd be nice, obviously, and it's probably not going to happen if we at least had a central definition that everyone agreed upon about what is chiropractic. Yep. And then, and then it differed state to state on how you do that. Hmm. And it's like, what is education? That's pretty standard in each state. Well, right. Department of Education kind of screwed that up, but no. um, yeah, that would be that would be beautiful. We'll go there, yeah. Well, um, that would be a beautiful thing if we were able to have the one definition, and then certainly because the way I look at it, if you choose to add modalities to your practice, that's your business. It's just not chiropractic, and so that that doesn't mean that that's a bad thing that you're asking to do. Um, I'm not trained. You know, I'll admit. What I learned in chiropractic school, I wouldn't want me hooking me up to machines. I'd want somebody who's the best of the best. And so if I have an issue, I would go to that person. I choose to be a specialist at chiropractic of locating, analyzing, and correcting vertebral subluxations. So that's all I do. If my patients want somebody else, I have a network of people that I can send them. And one of the things that I like about that is I can concentrate on checking and adjusting spines, but I can also expand my referral reach. Uh, by yeah. sharing things with other people. Um, yes. So, uh, you know, so that's, it's a philosophical decision for me, but it's also a business decision for me. Um, and so, you know, that, and that's just how I choose to do it. So, you know, it's certainly, you know, ethically, yeah, the state of South Carolina says I can do certain things. So within that, I choose to do um, locate, analyze, and correct the subluxation. And be so the that, best of the best there is at that. Yeah, well, that's, you know, the, the that. way I look at it, I can't claim in town that I'm the best if, if I'm doing a lot of other things, because therefore I'm not the best I can possibly be if I'm doing a ton of stuff. A great movie to watch on this is Jiro, J-I-R-O, Dreams of Sushi. Never heard of it? No. Jiro, Dreams of Sushi. And I assigned my students to watch it the first week in school, and you should see the eye rolls. This guy's asking us to make a, watch a movie about sushi. And it's, you have to read the movie because it's, it's in Japanese and there's subtitles. But it's about a man who has a small uh, sushi, sushi shop. Easy for me to say. I'm like Cindy Brady in that episode. But um, <laughs> he has a sushi shop in a subway. There's only 10 seats in his restaurant. All he does at his restaurant is cook sushi. If you want a steak, you have to go somewhere else. Um, but... Uh, what's happened is he's considered the number one sushi master in the world and he commands a $300 a plate sitting, you know, for an appetizer. 
There and you go. So, so that's way. So I would recommend people watch that movie and see how could this apply to my business in chiropractic if I had the sharp edge of locating, analyzing, and correcting vertebral subluxations. And um, tell me the it's called Dreams of Sushi, but what's the name of it? Jiro, J I R O. J I R O. Dreams of Sushi, and you All can right, get perfect. it. On, you can get it on Netflix. All right, sounds good. Yeah, it's, it's it. a great movie. So yeah, that'll. I mean, that alone we could do a Facebook live. All um, right, we'll so, do it. Yeah, it's really cool. So that gets us down to aesthetics, which is the study of art, and philosophically speaking, how that would apply to our office is not that we're putting Mona Lisa's and Michelangelo's David all over our office, but how does it look to the patient? So if you say that you're a family practice. Um, a, do you have family on your sign? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Uh, B, um, do you have a kid's area where the kids can feel welcome in the practice? Um, are your outlets covered, you know, so a kid can't stick their finger in it? Um, are your edges rounded where their little heads might start to bang into things? Moms notice this type of stuff, I think. Um, you know, what color are your walls? Uh, what are your posters on the wall? Are they all chiropractic posters? Are they no chiropractic posters? And I hear arguments for both. You have to figure out what's right for you. Um, you know, do you, you know, what does your CA wear? Do they wear scrubs? Do they wear a polo? Do they wear a button down? Do you let them pick what they're going to wear? Um, in my case, I love the idea because what I normally wear outside of the office is a t-shirt, jeans, or shorts and flip-flops. That's kind of my outfit. And so I love the idea of practicing that way because that's, that's my most genuine. So I kind of compromise, and I would wear jeans, but I would have a practice T-shirt. And typically, just because I'm a chiropractor, been all over all day, I had it untucked because it was going to end up there anyway. But one of the things that I heard in my town was people thought I was too casual. And so as a doctor taking care of people, I had a decision to make aesthetically in my practice. Do I, could, I had the right to keep doing what I was doing, but would it be better overall if I did something different? And so coincidentally, about the time I decided I wanted to make a change, Sherman went to a dress code policy. So it was all just business. And so, well, fantastic. I'll just wear my tie at Sherman and just wear it at the office. Nice. And the beauty of it is, uh, you know, I feel comfortable wearing a tie. It doesn't bother me. Um, and I think people are, you know, in my town are OK with it. You may live in another town that's fine with the shorts and the flip flops. So go for it. So you have to take a look at what do other people, what is their perception of a doctor? And no, I don't think you're letting the inmates run the asylum. You're playing to your audience um, as far that's as that's right. concerned. And so, you know, but that's something to take a peek at. So aesthetically, you know, you know how you're going to dress. You have, um, you know, aesthetically, are you going to do open adjusting? Are you going to do closed adjusting, right? And there's pluses and minuses for both. You can have an x-ray machine in your office. Are you going to have modalities in your office? You know, are you going to have your diploma in their face or in some um, obscure place? Are you going to have a water cooler, you know, to help people out? Are you, all these types of things fall under the aesthetics branch of philosophy. And so I, I wanted to talk because the students, all right, they know the branches, they know what it means, but they're not able to apply. Well, why would I use that in my practice? And here's why. So most people are out there thinking, well, I've thought of all those things and therefore there's your philosophy. And so mm -hmm. I don't have a philosophy. Everybody has a philosophy. You alone saying you don't have a philosophy is in and of itself a philosophy. Yes. So those would be the branches of philosophy. The last one is metaphysics. And metaphysics is what is our worldview? How does uh, the universe work? And so this is where, and the reason why I used it last, is this is where we start with the major premise. And because this is going to be the big one, this is going to be, uh, this is how I believe the universal works. And so I'm going to start there, and then I can whittle it down when I hit principle 23. And this is why it's important for you to be laying on my table once a week for the rest of your life or whatever you decide. Um, I don't like wellness care, just care is. Um, so uh, our major premise is a universal intelligence is in all matter and continu continually gives um, to it all its properties and actions, thus maintaining its existence. So then the first question becomes, well, what does that mean? 
And then there's where a lot of the times chiropractically we get into trouble. Um, this one may step on some toes. I don't believe that universal intelligence and God are the same thing. And we'll talk about that as we go. And that would be a great Facebook Live. Um, I pray to God every day, just so you know out there. And um, certainly when I'm driving up I-85 in Spartanburg. But um, that being said, I think it's different. And as we go through the principles, I'll explain why. So I'm going to leave that for another day. But I'll just throw it out there. Now, I do understand why it gets confused, because if you look at it just to start with, you have an, a U and an I, and people want to say, well, then automatically that makes it a person, and not quite, um, but then off we're going to go. For me, the, uh, we'll get to that. So, you, so let's look at the words. Why might they have chose universal? And so by definition, universal is going to exist at every level of reality. It doesn't have a, ben- a boundary or a limitation. It's everywhere. There's no place that it isn't. And that's the definition of universal. Some may be saying that's the universe, that may be the definition of God. And again, we can get to that later. But just so if you look at, you know, whether the universe has a wall at some place, I don't know. But if it does, then there's this fishbowl of the universe. And you, the intelligence, therefore, is going to be in every bit of that fishbowl, if that makes sense. Then we had the word um, intelligence was used. And so what do we think of when we think of intelligence? What do you think? Smart. Yeah. Smart. Wisdom. Wisdom. We have, if you read the definition, um, it's the ability to learn or understand or deal with new situations. It's the skilled use of reason. But what I like about definitions, typically what do we always do in the the dictionary? We read that first definition. Don't ignore the ones that are after it because they're just as valid. Uh, But the third definition of intelligence is the property of an organized system that is assumed to create the specific relationships within that system and or cause the organized actions of that system. And to me, that's why they picked um, intelligence. There's a property of the universe that does create the organization of things that we call stars, planets, galaxies, and solar systems. And so I think that's why. So characteristics of universal intelligence um it's creative it does create an organization right um it's the active principle of the universe um matter is going to be passive so you can think of matter as a bunch of legos on your carpet and they're not going to turn into something unless something says here's the plan to put these pieces together this way and so it's going to be infinite if we do assume an infinite universe um it's the causes of properties and actions Um, And then the properties and actions of that system are going to be the expressions um, of its organization. So those are kind of big, not big syllable words, but a lot of talking. So then organization, if we're looking at organization, this is specific parts moving in specific relationships with each other. So deductively, if we say something's organized a certain way, can we therefore say there should be an intelligence behind it? because that's what intelligence is, the property of that um, system creating specific relationships, which we would call that's, that's something that's organized. Does that make sense? Um, yes. The, the def- <laughs> yeah. What this one says is a universal intelligence is in all matter and continually gives to it all its properties and actions, thus maintaining it in existence. There's no yeah. organization in it. No, I'm getting there. The organization is within the intelligence. Oh, we haven't oh, gotten oh, past oh. intelligence. Yeah, we're, oh, okay. we're, I know this is how class goes. At this point, we've been talking, I don't know, for 10 minutes and we got into the third word. <laughs> okay, so, I like it. So yeah, yeah. I, I, I hear what you're saying and, and, and hang on to that thought with, with organization not being in the premise because um, I think it's a good thought. And so I'm, what, I, I like that you said I'm, I'm on the same page as you that and universal intelligence, in my opinion, is not God. Right. That God created universal intelligence sure. for all of this to be organized together. So I'm glad right. I'm glad we're on the same page there. So it will be fun to have that conversation oh, on a, a Facebook conversation. Live. And I invite those of you who have a differing view, when we do that, please join us. I yeah. will tell you, I will completely cancel you out if you can't be <laughs> respectful, because part right. of debate is being is being a, an adult about things. And that sure. means that we can all have a different opinion. So I'm sure. not saying that to you, Brian. I'm saying that to anyone that you. 
that okay. joins us that day. Okay. So universal intelligence and part of right. the intelligence. So, is so we have intelligence. Intelligence creates specific relationships, which is a word we would also. So it's a, a, a synonym, if you will, of the word organization. Right. Not in you know, so intelligence organizes. So if we see oh, something's okay. organized, it yes. had to come from an intelligence. Yes. OK, I like it. So then the question does become, is the universe organized or is it random? And organized. I would. What's that? I say organized. Why? Because I believe that God's word is true. And he says that. He knew the beginning from the end and right. nothing that happens is a surprise to him. And so it can't just be chaos. Right. There has to be a, an intelligence, which would have to be that there's order and there sure. is a lot of order in this world. Well, and, and I asked that question on my Facebook page at the office. I said, is the universe you know, organized? And, and the reason was this was a great way to start with universal intelligence with my patients. And then let's see how we can go. And, and one person chimed up, well, it's random like the stars. Well, if the stars were random, would there be constellations? No. Right? So, and would we find the Big Dipper in the same area of the sky year after year after year? No. You know? For the most part, our seasons are the same, right? Uh, we kind of know when it's going to be cold and we kind of know when it's going to be um, hot. I know in South Carolina, the, um, how did the, the eclipse go where you were? The last one that happened? You don't know? I don't know. It's always dark out there in Alaska. <laughs> but in South we're Carolina. We're 19 hours of daylight right now. <laughs> oh, well, good for you. <laughs> So in South Carolina, the eclipse went right over Sherman College. And so in the paper, they said it's going to go over at 247. Here's the thing. It wasn't like it's going to go over on Thursday. It's going to go sometime in the afternoon. They're like, it's going to be right over you at 247. And it was right over us at 247. That's crazy. In order for them to predict something like that, it has to be highly, highly, highly organized. And so... That's my ob using some observational of evidence of why I believe that principle one is true is I have to start with is the universe an organized place because that's what intelligence does. It creates nice. specific relationships. I so love that. Uh, we also use, right, you go to the beach, there's a tide chart. So we know when high tide's going to be, we know when low tide's going to be. We know when sunrise is going to be, we know when sunset's going to be. Look up the cycles of nature, the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle. All those things cycle around. They keep happening. If they didn't happen, life would cease to exist. And so there's something out there that put all this stuff in motion, right? Well, you could say God maybe put it all in motion, but the principles he's using are the physics of the universe, which to me is what actually universal intelligence is. It's the things that, you know, it's the forces that hold the things together or rip them apart, depending on what's supposed to happen at that point. And that's not a good or bad thing. That's just an is thing. Yeah. So, so we have universal intelligence is in all matter. Matter is defined as that which is organized. So what's it going to be organized by? It's got to go back to intelligence, right? Uh, you look at the definitions of matter, um, you know, and I like one of its definitions, a material substance of a particular kind for a particular purpose. So really matter in a general sense. We have protons, neutrons, and electrons. There's kind of three things, and I know that there's smaller things, but just to use a simple analogy, and then you, but you organize them in different ways, and it's something totally different from whatever the thing is next to it. Um, but it really comes down to those small parts. So that's kind of cool. Um, continually, this is going to be seemingly without interruption. So as far as we know, to know, the universe continues to be organized. If it's continually organized, does it make sense logically that then there's something that intelligence is continually working on it? I think it does. So it's going to form a continuous series of events. Um, when we get to properties, a property is going to be the essential motion um, to the identity of a thing. So this is what's going to give its identity. So what would the property of water be, do you think? It's fluid. Nope. It can have lots of properties. It can be steam. It could be... Yeah, but those aren't properties. Fluid. But here's the thing. Chemically speaking, if we go to traditional science... Yes, they are property, so I get that. But this is what BJ was saying back in 1927. 
He's defining it as it's essential motions to identify it. So in this case, it would be the motions to bond two hydrogens to an oxygen. Right? Water is H2O. So that would be its property. Right? Okay. So the motion in the organization is going to be occurring in the bonds and the electrons zipping around each other. Okay. Right? So that's, so the, you know, therefore, so then we go to the actions. These are what are called the non-essential motions. And this is where you get into uh, fluid, steam, and a solid with its ice. Okay. Right? So the actions, so, you know, room temperature, water is the fluid. Right? So it's just moving at whatever speed it moves. It's vibrating back and forth. When it's ice, it's vibrating at a slower rate. And when it's steam, it's vibrating at a faster rate. Right? But at the end of the day, it's still all H2O. Right? So it's still yeah. all water. And that's why the property of water is going to be the H2O. How fast it's moving for the state that it's going to create, that's what's going to be defined as its actions in the major premise. Okay. Does that work? Yeah. So then maintaining is to keep it in a certain state um, and uh, position or activity. So it's going to keep things in a certain state. So you and I, you know, we're, you know, we've got our electrons are vibrating around to keep us us. If it didn't, we just fall apart. Kind of like the end <laughs> of uh, Infinity War. If you haven't seen it, I apologize. <laughs> I uh, have not seen it. Yeah, it's a good movie. Good movie. Uh, and then at the end, it gets to existence, right? And so existence is defined as being real, uh, the state of being real, actual or current, rather than imagined, invented, um, or obsolete. Um, it's, it's presence in place or situation. So however you want to look at that, here is an issue. When you brought up organization earlier, I actually think it would be a better word than existence. So... What the major premise, though, is saying is that matter exists. It's organized and maintained continually by this thing called um, the major premise. What it doesn't talk about was matter was created. So the major premise is making the assumption matter is already here, right? Because the creation of matter, that's when you get into uh, is there a God or is there not a God? Or do you believe in God or do you not? And so if we come at it from that angle, it doesn't matter who's in your office. The most staunchest of, of a Bible thumper to the most atheistic of atheists, you can still say, well, let's just talk about this organization of the universe. And we'll start there. You know, we don't have to have that other argument. Um, you know, no matter what side of the fence you fall on, I think you can have the conversation with whoever walks in your office regarding universal intelligence. You know, you get somebody in and you say, well, let's talk about universal intelligence. Oh, no, you're a Jesus freak. I'm out the door, you know, and which and, um, you know, we don't want that to happen because they're subluxated, too, and they need to get taken care of. So how can we use our principles and educate them using those principles without, you know, stepping on their toes? And so so then some may, well, you're just denying it. Well, no, I'm, I'm still not denying the presence of God. I just think it's the tool that God uses. But if the atheist walks in the door, I'm just going to say it's the organizing principle of the universe. It's physics, fella. You know, that's what the universal intelligence is. So then when we say something like limitations of matter, yep. if, if here we're saying that which matter is that which is organized, right. so we're, we're saying um, limitations of that which is organized. Right. So that doesn't make sense. I'm organized a certain way, correct? Yeah. Uh, if I hold my head underwater for five minutes, am I breathing? You're not going to. No. So in that situation, the way that my matter is organized is very limited for my organism to survive. Okay. Yeah, I'm not going to grow gills. Probably not. No. That'd be really, really yeah. awkward. I suppose you'd have to actually experiment it, but I'm not willing to do it. So if somebody out there wants to YouTube themselves, no, I'm just kidding. That's yeah. right. Let's Is that one of happens. those random clinical trials? Yeah, exactly right. I'll be the control. I'll be Let's the one with see. the scuba gear. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see if you grow gills because yeah. you had under the water for but, five minutes. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, I'm organized, but my organization only allows me to do certain things. Right? So if I stay out in the sun too long, I'm probably going to get a sunburn. Yes. 
you know, okay. and it's, just, it's, a, it's the same sort of deal. You know, I'm going to be organized a different way, right? I'm not going to be organized the same way I was before when I wasn't burned. And I'm still organized tightly enough that it's like, yep, that's still Brian Dooley. He's just a really red one at this point. So I guess in my mind, looking at that, like in terms of limitations of matter, if we just talk about matter and this is how, this is how your body was designed or this is, this right. is how your body is supposed to function. It's supposed to function at a hundred percent optimum capacity. Like this, this is what the human body does. Right. However, when, when we try to change its organization because of stressors, right? Because mm -hmm. of those, those three things, yeah. then now its organization has changed. And so we have to then and it put in force in order to move it back to that state of matter the way it was designed. Exactly. Okay. The way intelligence wanted it in the first place. Now, one of the things that we tend to do is we start talking about the initial principles and go right into the human body because we're chiropractors and that's what we deal with mostly. But we're still just talking universal here, right? We're a part of the universe. So right now we're just still in, there's matter out there. And if, if I know that a door is a door and I know a planet is a planet and a solar system is a solar system, then therefore there's something putting all that matter together to organize it as such. So that human, um, with our human minds, we can define it um, consistently. So there's your, right, what, why do they want to do scientific methods? Something that's proven over and over and over again. A planet's a planet, a planet is a planet, unless you're poor Pluto, right? Which I still think is a planet. <laughs> so that's a nod to Mr. Skirna, my science teacher back in the day. So it's still a planet. <laughs> They're not taking planet away from me. No, Pluto I'm not taking five, that but... away from me. So. <laughs> You're still good, Pluto. Wait a whole time. You're still good in our, my house. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Well, this has been awesome. I, I took so. tons of notes and um, we didn't get this at Logan. We didn't have these kinds no. of dive into the the 33 principles. So I appreciate it. And in, in my, well, I have a special birthday this year and let's Do just say that. Okay. It's <laughs> you look great for 29. Oh, uh, thank you very much. You're very yes, welcome. You're right. It's going to be 30 this year. <laughs> I've been wondering what that age is like Yeah, I'm sure. for 20 years. <laughs> yeah. But you know, you brought up a good point. So can you see by just talking about the major premise where you put a room full of chiropractors together, that there can be confusion, uh, there can be downright debate, and there can be downright some of the anger maybe that you talked about earlier, right? Because I'm seeing it this way, well, I'm seeing it this way, and I'm seeing it this way, and, and a lot of it comes from, you know, did BJ use the best words he possibly could have? Um, some out there are saying absolutely he did, and some are saying no, he didn't. So right there we're arguing about it. But that's okay. So let's, but, but if we're going to say he did, all right, well, let's run it through a process that says, why wouldn't this word be? We've got to get out of the thing because that's how BJ wrote it. And I know there's a reason he wrote things a certain way, but let's play with it a little bit and see, all right, does this actually say the concept better than, than it's, it's our ethical duty um, to write it that way and talk about it that way? And because yeah, I think, you know, that's a big thing that that happens is people just look at this stuff and I'm just kind of confused in what it says. So I'm just not even going to take the time to learn the doggone principles because they're confusing. Yes. Avoid that which confuses you, which right. isn't a good way, a good way to do things. No, Kat I says mean, innate, 100 percent. Yeah, absolutely. And Robin said, you guys are fun to listen to. I know, right? Yeah, I'm having that's a great why, time. <laughs> <laughs> that's why people tune in to us. Well, good. Yeah, we should have a fun time. Right? I mean, this is fun stuff. This is, to me, this is just fun stuff to talk about. Yeah, I agree. So I, yeah, I'd sit there and talk to the dog about it. He's not as impressed. <laughs> And it's a one-sided conversation, <laughs> right. but I'll still talk to him a little bit. Why does he think I'm smart? Because yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's at least one person in my household <laughs> thinks I'm a pretty right. smart cookie. That's right. <laughs> it could be all the treats I give him while he listens to me, but well, you know, wh whatever it takes, <laughs> whatever, whatever it takes to keep him close. Yeah. An well, ethical bribe. There you go. Um, <laughs> hey, Dr. Brian, thank you so much. This was fun. And thanks to all of you who joined us. Um, I learned a lot. I hope all of you did. And I think these are great conversations to have with our practice members. And, mm -hmm. and as well, the, uh, I think it was Kat wrote, 
um, she said, my brother-in-law graduated from Duke Medical School and decided he didn't want to be a doctor anymore because he learned that all medical doctors do is give their best guess based on symptoms. Well, I mean, isn't that what diagnosis is? You break down the word, it's two people mm -hmm. not knowing. Yeah. So I'm, I'm glad that we don't diagnose in our practices. Instead, no. we just locate, analyze, and, and correct verbal subluxation. So that's a good thing. I think so. <laughs> awesome. Hey, thanks so much, everybody. Have a great weekend if this was your last day of work. If not, I'll catch you on the work the workforce tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll see you again. Do we have the next one scheduled? I two don't know. Weeks? I don't know. I think either, it's but, two weeks, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but it may not happen because our son is getting married that weekend. And do it I will from be the wedding. On the, yeah, there we'll you go. We'll do it from the wedding. I'm sure his bride would be very happy that I am doing a Facebook Live during the wedding. Yeah. She may do something about your organization. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and I think I'm going to be shot down on that one. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we'll make sure that we, that we make up for it and maybe we'll do it a different day to all of you. Thanks again for Beautiful. tuning in. It was tons of fun. Have a great evening. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.